Hey, everybody. Welcome to the B2B Revenue Leadership Podcast. Hey, what we do on this podcast is talk about what B2B sales and marketing uh, leaders, operators, and experts are doing today to really break through and grow their businesses at exponential levels. Let's get it in the interview. At the end, I'll give you an update on my courses and you can check out my website at b2brevenue.com and it's Brian G. Burns on LinkedIn. Hey, Scott, welcome to the show. As a way of getting started, give us a little update on yourself. Brian, good to see you again, man. Um, yeah, I've, I've you know recently decided to step out on my own and uh, I've gone full-time with a couple of my businesses, uh, my consulting business, Scott Lee's Consulting, um, specifically working with companies in the kind of zero to 25 million ARR spot. That, that's been my sweet spot as an operator and, and as an advisor. Uh, and Surf and Sales is growing. We're, we're looking to do four events in, uh, in 2020. So yeah, I'm, I'm working on those things full time now. I, I just uh, stepped away from this company Qualia that I've been at for a little over three years. It's doing incredibly well and I'm really proud of what we've built and uh, excited to see them continue, but it's just time for me to kind of do my own thing for a little while. Cool. Well, let's talk about that. Um, when you typically come in, uh, what is the problem that you, you, the, the founder and the person bring you in to solve? Is it growth? Is it correction? Is it figuring it out? Uh, typically, typically it's like, it's like scaling, right? Like they, they've got, you know, a few deals and some logos and, you know, maybe a hundred to 250 K kind of ARR. Right. And they, they've raised some money and, but they, they don't really know how to, you know, get to 10 reps successfully or 50 reps successfully. Right. And, and so we go through and we talk through, you know, sales strategy, go to market, where to find the leads, how to distribute the leads, what kind of tools should be in the tech set tech stack. Uh, we kind of refine messaging and collateral and pitch and rebuttals and workflow and all this kind of stuff. And and then, you know, my network has grown so large over the last few years that um, I've been able to do a lot of help with recruiting now as well. So I've been bundling executive recruiting and frontline recruiting into the work that we do. Um, and so usually it's, it's that stuff. It's like we, we, we kind of have shown product market fit. I need to nail it in a way that will let us grow, you know, much, much faster. And, and so that's usually where I come in and, you know, that's, that's where all of my experience has been as an operator for 15 plus years. So it's kind of my, my sweet spot. Cool. And what do you typically see wrong when you go in? Is it just a hob, hodgepodge where it's like the blind leading the blind, a bunch of stray cats? What, what well, do you usually find? I, you know, honestly, what, probably the most common thing is that, the the head of product or the founder is you know rightfully so but they're like really really proud and enamored of their product yeah and so they want to talk about every single thing that it can do right and and, and show off this toy and and so i inevitably have to say to them look this you know we're way over complicating things here yeah i need you to rip out like 80 percent of the things that you want to talk about and how do we distill it down to you know the three or four like key ingredients, you know, key features or, or what's the core problem that, you know, your product is solving. And so it's that simplification process that is, is probably the biggest commonality amongst all the, the founders and companies that I talk to. And do you get pulled into really complicated? There's the, what, what kind of price point is the typical product that you feel that you are the superstar? Oh, man, it's, it's, it's all over. I mean, everything from, couple hundred dollar a month services type businesses to, you know, million dollar um, enterprise construction deals and things like that all over the place. But, but, you know, if I was trying to say, you know, the average it's, it's the, you know, SaaS businesses that are selling products for, you know, $10,000 a year to, you know, six figures a year, probably. Right. Yeah. That, that's kind of mostly what I see. And, and you know, give me some feedback because what I see is everyone's trying to use a 15 year old playbook in that space and trying to, what I do, dumb things faster. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I see my role is trying to help them not do some of those dumb things faster yeah. and not, not use some of these old playbooks. Yeah. 
you know, I, I never followed those old playbooks myself. Um, I, I've always kind of done things my own way. And, you, you know, you and I have talked about this before and the way that I got into sales is different. And, you know, my experience has kind of shaped my philosophy on sales. And, and I think I'm a different kind of sales leader than a lot of others that are out there. And, and so I, I definitely think that I'm fighting against um, that trend that you seem to be uh, also fighting against. Well, it, it takes the assumption that there's pull. And, you know, managing and servicing pull, pull meaning market demand, yeah. versus push, no one knows who you are, there's no brand, you've got yeah. to go establish a beachhead. Yeah. That's a very different sale and different problem yeah. to solve. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And I, and I've always been, you know, on the push side, you know, yeah, so I. <laughs> I mean, I, it's hard for me to fathom sometimes like what it would be like to have things flying at me, you know? Um, but I, I just have always loved that early stage stuff and, and building things and figuring it out and the early wins and the momentum. And, um, you know, that's, so I'm, I'm, even though I'm not working for somebody, you know, full time right now, and I'm working for a lot of different people, you know, at once, I, it really scratches the itch for me. And, and it's, it's really what I love to do. You like to do multiple ones simultaneously? Yeah, you know, there's, there's a, there's a ceiling, right? Like, I can't, I can't be working with hundreds of people at the same time. But um, yeah, you know, there, there's a sweet spot that I feel is right for me, where I can dedicate the right amount of time and energy to, to everybody um, each week. And it, it's, it's, it's fun. Like I said, I feel like it keeps me on the pulse of, um, the sales world, right? Different types of sales, different industries and products, different types of pitches and demos and strategies and price points. Like, you know, it keeps me sharp, I think. Right. And, and, um, really keeps me involved and entertained, you know, you know, as well as I do, I think that, you know, you, if you work one place for too, too long, you know, you kind of can get stale talking about the same product over and over. So it's fun to be able to, you know, kind of help solve lots of different problems at once. Yeah. And what I typically found when I, I went on premise was you, you talk to the leadership team and they say, the salespeople aren't doing this right and this right and this right. And then you talk to the salespeople and they're like, oh, the product doesn't work. The support isn't yeah. good. Uh, everyone's difficult and the market's really tight. How do you kind of reconcile all that? Well, tequila. <laughs> <laughs> Come to Jesus. Yeah. You go surfing. <laughs> yeah. You know, th this, this is something that I'm, you know, pretty passionate about. You know, I, I, I strongly dislike that um, it feels like the hammer drops on sales leadership all the time. And we are held to, uh, particular standards that other people are not, you know, right. I show me the last time a head of product has missed a couple deadlines on their releases and the hammer has dropped on them. Never. It, I couldn't really tell you, show me the last time a head of engineering, um, was disciplined, let alone let go for missing hiring goals, even to grow the engineering team. Right. But you know, you're the head of sales, you miss any of those things, you're in big trouble. And, you know, the product's not working as good as it should, or it's the support is letting you down and damaging the reputation. And therefore, that's harder for sales to hit numbers. The axe is falling on us right now, you know, 16 to 18 month average tenure and, and, and dropping. Um, it's difficult for me to reconcile. And so I feel like part of my mission now is to kind of try to help salespeople take the power back a little bit and, and educate some founders that, you know, this dynamic is not, is not really working. It's not really fair. And, you know, you're going to start having trouble finding people willing to take on these gigs when they're going to get treated that way. Well, uh, the analogy I always had was, you know, when you go in to get a haircut and you bring a picture of Brad Pitt and you say, I want to look like this. That, that's really what the founder is saying. It's like, I want to be like this company. Well, that company is in the tornado and you're not. <laughs> you, there's a light breeze around here that we're trying to manage. <laughs> right, right. And so you, they're not looking for a hairdresser. They're looking for a magician. 
And yeah. it takes, you know, that third quarter where they figure out you're not a magician and you, you is the, you're in the middle. You're between the client and the market and the founder and the, the people building the product. Yeah. And that reconciliation and handshake, because typically the founder is not a salesperson. Typically, that's been my experience as yeah. well. Yeah. They're usually on the product side. Yeah. 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 Product, finance, that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and it's almost like they want to outsource this nasty part of dealing with the real issues to get revenue. Because it's not just convincing the client. It's getting the order through the gauntlet of administrative and political things within the company that, you know, they don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and then as the sales leader, you have to educate them but also, you know, build up the infrastructure and the team to do that. Yeah, <clears throat> there's a there's a there's a lot of things that are involved behind the behind the scenes, you know. And and I, I kind of hope that more sales leaders are are willing to share and talk about that kind of thing. You know, yeah. I, I talk to people who are kind of looking for their first VP of sales job all the time, and they are not to their own fault, but they're Bliss, blissfully unaware of some of the challenges that they're going to be facing, you know? Um, and, and so I think it's, I think we have a little bit of a responsibility to shed some light on, on that stuff. And, and I, and I think hopefully more and more founders start to pay attention and, and adjust, you know, their way of managing and, and, and operating. And, and I, and I hope sales professionals start to get a little smarter when they go interview and evaluate which companies to work for, yeah. you know. And from your perspective, what makes a great VP of sales? Well, <clears throat> so many different things. I mean, I, I really, back to what I was saying before, but I think in the very beginning, like just taking a complicated product or a complicated sale and being able to simplify it, being able to find a way you know, to explain it to, you know, your 12 year old, right. Or, or, or your parents or something like that. Right. Yeah. I always felt like if I could, ex if I could figure out a way to explain what the heck I'm doing to my kid or to my mom or something like that, um, then I, then I've done a good job. So that simplification to me is the first step, right. Then I think you have to be a very, very good recruiter. And, and, the only way to really grow and scale the sales organization to me is to surround yourself with really talented people. Uh, you're not going to get really talented people unless you are very good at recruiting. As I'm, I mean, and again, I'm talking specifically in this push scenario where I don't have resumes flying at me all the time, right? right. Nobody knows who the heck we are. How do I get Brian to join my, you know, early stage company with two AEs right now, right? Yeah. Um, so I got to be really good at recruiting, you know, both sort of uh, selling the opportunity, sure, and the company, sure. But, you know, really right now, it's all about selling the opportunity to kind of develop somebody. You know, I think people want more and more mentorship, more and more coaching, and they want it from the company. They want it from their boss. They want to feel like this person is looking out for me and going to help nurture and develop my career. And so, you know, my third point would be that, that part right there. Like, I think what makes a very good VP of sales is somebody who puts the time in and genuinely cares about their people and, you know, it helps them along the way. How do I get Brian from here to here? How do I help Brian get to where he eventually wants to go? And being really transparent, you know, that's my fourth point, I guess, you know, a perfect example, you know, if, if somebody has done so well that they've sort of broke my comp plan or is ready for a particular role that I don't have anymore, you know, I'm super transparent and straight up with them. You know, I talk to them about, you know, maybe it's time for, for them to leave. I am willing to help them find, you know, next gig, be a, a reference, whatever. I, I don't hold people back. Um, and, and, and I think people appreciate that from, from sales leaders. So those, those are some of the things that, that to me, um, you know, mean the most right now, at least. 
Because I think too many sales leaders take more of an authoritarian carrot and stick type approach. I completely agree with you. And I had this conversation the other day with, uh, with a friend of mine and we were talking about um, kind of the role of data and, and how, you know, data is kind of everything right now. And that concerns me a little bit because the humanity is removed when all you're looking at is numbers and all you're looking at is data. And, you know, salespeople are not binary like that, right? I know everybody wants to take the magic out of it, but we are the magic. This yes. salesperson's personality and charisma and spontaneity and all these, like, you know, the charm, there is magic in there. And, and I don't, you know, I'm not saying that data is no good. I'm just saying, I think I'm, I'm a little concerned we've skewed so far away from the humanity of it all that that, that worries me. You know, and well, you end up with this authoritarian kind of style or this really kind of deadpan, well, the numbers say this and you're this, so off you go, right? Yeah, I heard that on another show where they were talking about like stupid things like win rate. Well, anytime you set up an equation, people game it. It's called Goodhart's Law, right? If you focus on number of calls, believe me, yeah. they can get a number of calls. Yeah, it's, but, it's like but, trying but, to run an experiment without bias. Once somebody knows what right. they're observation on. bias. Yeah, yeah. And but that you don't get trust out of that. You get distrust. And what you're talking about, I always had the metaphor of the mafia was the right sales management model. Meaning that Tell you're me more in, about that. I'm you, Italian. I love this already. Well, what, what is the mafia? It's a, it's a family that aren't related in most cases, right? A matra. It, it is this, I have your back, so you have my back. It's this level of trust communication. You don't talk outside this circle, mm -hmm. right? And when things change, you go to jail, you, someone else goes to jail, I take care of your family. It is that level of community mm -hmm. that works. And yeah. I've had a lot of friends throughout my career, you know, the VP would go to another startup and the mafia would go with them. Right. It was, uh, you know, open the box, add water. Here's the sales team. Right. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. They got rapport. They know each other and they got each other's back. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think every good VP of sales should be able to have that. It, yeah. it would be a red flag to me if I was a founder recruiting a head of sales and, and they didn't have, you know, their own little crew. Yeah. And, you know, I, I kind of had it uh, when I had a sales engineer, same sales engineer for 15 years, five different mm -hmm. companies. Mm -hmm. Right. And it was just this prepackaged team. Yeah. And there was a red flag from the VP when that rep didn't have somebody they wanted to bring with them. Right. Or so, someone didn't want to work with them. Yeah, I agree. hundred percent with that. You know, and people today is like, oh, I'll just call a recruiter and have a bunch of college grads come in with. Yeah, you know, that just, I, I think, you know, here's another thing that is going to make a VP great moving forward. I think that they have got to have a massive network and they've got to have a presence, you know, on LinkedIn, maybe uh, in particular. Um, and they've got to be known. They've got to be able to draw people in and you've got to spend time doing that. I, I can tell you right now, in over three years at Qualia, I never once spent a dime on any kind of recruiting services whatsoever. I never put up a job ad. I never paid for, you know, uh, extra help recruiting. All I did was reach out to my network and have my team, who I was coaching to actively grow their network, also reach out to people. Um, and I, I really think that um, that is going to be a trend that continues to pick up pick up steam among sales leaders. And the thing is, that has just been automated, right? And that's what we did before we had technology. We, we would call up our friends and see who was available, who they know, and that the tribe would reconstruct. And today it's, you know, it's faster, right? It's we might faster work. And I, th and I think much larger. Much larger. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Much and larger, much faster. And that's how, you know, you, you came back on the show was I put out the request. I wanted to hear from who you thought the best salespeople were. 
And some people self-nominate it. Not, most people nominated someone else. And that's been insanely effective because most of those people have never been on a podcast before. Mm-hmm. And they're like, what's a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. But that's how y- you network. And, you know, hiring strangers, if you're going to have that nine months of, did I hire the right person? And that you don't have that honest openness, the communication, the trust, where people are telling you the real thing, you count calls and meetings and demos instead of what's really being done. Yep. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, you talk to enough people who've worked for me, you know, they will tell you that I'm, I'm hard on them and I, and I push them, but they completely believe and trust that I'm, I've got their best interests. You know, they see me fight for them, you know, behind the scenes or, you know, push for promotions or raises and more equity and, you know, better leads, more, more tools to help us do it. And all those things matter. Like these are, these are things that I'm trying to do to make their lives easier. Right. And that's what reps want from a sales leader. And st- they don't need the hounding, right? Th- th- they're motivated by commission and money and achievement and success and winning. What they need from a leader is to get the internal system to work for them. Yeah. Get the product, marketing, finance, sales admin, operations, yeah. all that stuff to smooth yeah. through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, if, it's, it's, a, it's a game of, you know, how do I remove obstacles out of your way? You're my sales rep. My, my job is to get everything out of your way possible. Yeah. Clear, clear path for you so your job becomes as easy as it can possibly be. You know, and I, I had one leader said, oh, no, you, you have to work around the system. I go, yeah, I, I guess I have to, but I was hoping you'd help. <laughs> <laughs> well, my response would have been, no, I need to tear the system down. <laughs> and, and fix and it. We need to create a new system that yeah. is more efficient. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. Hey, uh, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to follow you and learn more about your work? Well, you know, we've been talking a lot about LinkedIn. I'm, I have a very active presence on LinkedIn. So I, I would encourage anybody who wants to chat to reach out to me through there. Uh, my website is scottleesconsulting.com uh, for my you know, advisory and consulting and training purposes. Uh, and then I would love everybody to check out surfandsales.com. You know, Surf and Sales is an alternative to the uh, major Dreamforce style conferences. Uh, I'm kind of bucking a trend and trying to you know, create something called micro conferences, which are small, intimate events where you're learning and collaborating and networking, but also combine a little vacation out of, out of the thing. So um, we're doing four events in 2020. We've done what we did one in 2018 and two in 2019. And now we're doing four in 2020. And next one is uh, this coming February in 2020 in, in Costa Rica. So check out surfandsales.com and, uh, Hope to see some of you there. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that interview. Hey, I want to make sure you're checking out b2brevenue.com. That is where you can get a free copy of an ebook that I did. It's a real ebook. It's not um, uh, a fluff book. It shows and talks about how companies make buying decisions and how you can influence that from both a marketing and a sales standpoint, how to find all the people that are in the decision path and what they need to see, know, and touch and feel before they make a product selection. If your team needs some coaching, some help, some training, some systems, some processes that do work today, because we know what doesn't work, or you know what doesn't work, I'll show you what does work and how to connect and get into pretty much any account. Uh, It includes deal coaching and content community, and I can customize it for your particular company. Just so Go to b2brevenue.com, look under training, schedule a call with me. We can talk it over or just sign up. Uh, You can pay per month or all at once, whichever makes most sense for your budget. Also, uh, I put out videos pretty much daily on uh, LinkedIn and on YouTube. On LinkedIn, it's Brian G. Burns. And on YouTube, it's Brian Burns Sales. Just search for that if you like 
to consume some video content. And if you see me on LinkedIn, uh, please put a comment uh, and a share and a like on some of the videos. I really appreciate it. I've got a company page for each podcast. Uh, This one, the B2B Revenue Leadership Podcast, where I put both content and humor uh, videos out daily and tell a friend about the podcast. Really appreciate you listening. Check out the show notes for all the partners and the connections you can make there. Uh, the coupon codes for the products to evaluate them, see if they're a right match for you. And we'll see you next time.